Hey guys, trying to share the screen, but somehow it doesn't pop up. Yeah, that's because I'm share still sharing the, <laughs> oh, okay. the announcement. Just hang on a second. You should be yes, able to share it's it working. Now. Okay, looking good. Cool. Let's wait just a couple of minutes so we start on time, if you don't mind. Okay, uh, thanks for waiting. Um, I think we are all ready to jump into the next session, which is about automated migration of VMs from VMware or OpenStack to Bluebird. So I'll hand it over to you, Alessandro and Gabriel, so you can introduce yourselves and, and take it from here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'm with Alessandro Pilotti, um, CEO at Cloud Based Solutions, and with me is also my colleague Gabriel. Uh, we will uh, show you a couple of things. So first I will run a few slides just to set a little bit of the context, what Coriolis is, how cloud migrations work and so on. And then uh, Gabriel will, will continue with that awesome demo. Okay. So a little bit on the context. Uh, the, the main idea is that we, you know, in our history working in clouds, so first with OpenStack and then with Kubernetes and so on, we saw that customers and users are always all the time moving between different generations, you know, of, of IT infrastructure, you know, moving from physical service to VM, uh, infrastructure as a service, then containers now, serverless and so on. So what we really liked with the Kubernetes project uh, was the, the idea of bridging that gap between VMs and the and containers, you know, so those are two different generations in this journey across infrastructure, if you want. And, um, and you know, we ended up in a way in having like uh, people running VMs, typically either on OpenStack or on VMware or whatever else, you know, and then having completely different infrastructure for running uh, containers, I mean, Kubernetes and so on. So, um, um, the main idea here is to be able to migrate to those workloads in order to reduce the time that, that users might need, you know, to, to adopt a new platform. Uh, what we really like, of course, in, in Kubernetes is that there is a unified management API. So having Kubert uh, on top of that means that the, the users can just have a, a single, let's say, pay to, to, to manage all the stuff, VMs, containers, and so on, and not having to bother with, with a lot of different environments. Workloads can spawn across VMs and containers, so sharing resources, like, you know, uh, sharing the same uh, networking resources, storage, uh, PVs, and so on. Um, 
And also very important, this way customers can just get rid of, uh, I mean, users can get rid of, you know, their legacy platform. So you don't need to have uh, your traditional VMware stack, you know, there just to keep running VMs when you can run everything all together. So that's very important in order to, to reduce the time that, that you need to onboard on, on a new technology, on a new platform. Um, when we talk about migration, okay, it's a relatively complex topic, but let's say that we can reduce it for now to two to very simple um, points. One of them is lift and shift, in which we take VMs, we consider them like black boxes, and we move them from A to B, let's say from uh, whatever infrastructure they're running at the moment to Qbert, um, uh, as we're talking about already now. No? This is great for legacy applications, Linux or Windows doesn't really matter because uh, um, you know it's, it's 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 much easier you don't have to deal with all the complexity the fact that they might not be containerized in, and 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 the fact that, that you simply might not know how to handle them outside of a vm scenario uh, one big advantage of lift and shift is that it can be fully automated on the opposite side we have replatforming or containerization if you want in this case which it's great, but it cannot be fully automated, meaning that you typically have to look into each individual workload, understanding you know which services are needed, which processes, put those into containers, write in Docker files, and yada yada. Okay, and it doesn't really work for all legacy workloads, unlike lift and shift, which since it doesn't care about uh, you know what's inside of those VMs, makes everything much easier from that from that point of view. Um, so lift and shift sounds easy, but in reality, it's it's quite complex per se. First, uh, you have to deal with uh, uh, virtual, different virtual disk formats, which is the easiest of those points. You know, For example, if you come from VMware, you typically um, have a, um, a VMDKs, while uh, um, you know, running on something like KVM with, uh, with QEMU, you end up with either RO files or, or QCOW2 or whatever. You, know? you have different synthetic kernel drivers. Um, on one side, you have a hypervisor, for example, a 6i, or if you're using on OpenStack, which is the other topic we're talking today, you might have uh, different hypervisors, like could be KVM, could be Hyper-V, could be, again, a 6i. Um, so virtual yo for KVM, you can have VMware tools, of course, for uh, for your 6i. Uh, you have LIS on, um, on Hyper-V and so on. Uh, then you might have to uh, rebuild the initr D images because you need different kernel modules that need to start doing it to run when, when the kernel boots. You have SC Linux, of course, SC Linux will, will see that there is a completely different underlying hardware and obviously freak out and tell you, well, you cannot run right now because somebody changed radically everything right now. You have different PCI IDs, which also means uh, dealing potentially with different network configurations. And then you have also different provisioning agents. For example, if you move um, um, to, to Kubevert, uh, you might need to run a cloud init, a cloud based init. Uh, you know, on Azure, you might have something like the Azure WA Linux agent and so on. So all those things need to be taken into account. Um, Coriolis was the project that we created exactly for that. The idea is to do fully automated lift and shift migration from and to any cloud virtualization solution. It has to be scalable. Doesn't matter if you do one or a thousand migrations at a time, it just has to work. Um, of course, in the limits of what your physical infrastructure is. It's agentless, and this is very important, meaning that you don't have to run anything inside of the actual VMs. Uh, and the VMs actually can still run. There is no reason to stop the VMs while this work is in progress. The migration is in progress. It has a REST API for full automation. It has a graphical user interface, a web, API, a web interface, and a command line one. Both of them sit, of course, in front of the REST API. And very important, the architecture is fully decoupled from individual clouds and virtualization solutions. That means that when we add support for new ones, it's relatively simple and we don't need to touch actually the core of Coralis itself. Here is a quick uh, intro on the architecture. You can see there is a, on top, of course, the, uh, the clients. Uh, then you have the REST API. You have a conductor where pretty much all the logic stays. You have a scheduler, which as name implies, is in charge of scheduling. And then very important, you have the workers, which are the ones which are going to talk to the individual clouds. Uh, we use a couple of um, OpenStack projects here, Keystone for identity and Barbican for storing secrets. Uh, secrets meaning that when we get credential to access source and target clouds, uh, we don't need to share them in clear text across, uh, across the whole uh, stack. We just store them in Barbican and we retrieve them and the worker processes just retrieve them when it's the time to um, to talk to the individual clouds. 
Um, all those are um, basically microservices. They talk among each other with MQP, can be easily containerized. And again, we come from a background of uh, cloud builders, meaning that we, we, we contributed a lot to both OpenStack, we work a lot in Kubernetes days. So it was written like, like a cloud service, basically. Okay, I'm going quickly because I want to get to the demo as fast as possible. Um, supported clouds and virtualization solutions. So we have um, um, well, OpenStack with various type of hypervisors, KVM, Hyper-V, ESXi, Send, Azure, Azure Stack, AWS, VMware with Sphere, Hyper-V and System Center, Send Server, Overt, Oracle OCI, OCI Classic, Oracle VM, Kubevert, of course, and we are also adding support for GC. That means basically talking about Kubevert that you can basically migrate your VMs from pretty much any of those source environments. So you have VMs on AWS, no problem. You can migrate them to Kubevert. You have them in Azure, same. So this, we limited, of course, this particular um, session to, to, to OpenStack and, and, and VMware for the simple reason that we don't have the time to, <laughs> to demo all of them, but the same concepts that we're going to, to demo apply uh, to them to all those, uh, those clouds and virtualization solutions. Um, OS morphing is a step that we do uh, during, the, um, during the migration. Is, um, um, is needed when a guest instance most moves between different platforms and architectures. For example, ES6i to, to KVM, like in the case of uh, vSphere to Kubert, as we mentioned before. Um, we're, going to, we're using basically some, some worker VMs uh, or, or containers that we spawn on the target environment. We attach basically the volumes in which we pre-replicated all the content of the VMs, of the disks that are attached to the VMs, and we discover what type of OS type and distro we have, and then we take some specific actions um, which are specific to those environments, for example, adding virtual IO drivers, adding cloud init, and whatever else, okay? Uh, on, the, on the supported guest operating system, um, also here, um, the, the, the support for the guest is fully decoupled from the core of the project. So we have, of course, all the um, Red Hats, uh, RHEL, uh, CentOS, Oracle, Linux families, um, Debian, Ubuntu, SUSE, um, Fedora, OpenSUSE, and all the supported Windows versions, both on the client and on the server side. Um, there is a GUI that uh, we are going to, to demo right now. So it's a very modern and nice single page type application within React.js. Like most of uh, Corelli's components, it's also open source. Um, um, when we started this project, uh, originally it was meant for migrations, and then people started a lot about, hey, can I also use it for disaster recovery? So this is a feature that we added and fits very well in the way in which Coriolis works. Um, Coriolis introduces, of course, the disaster recovery as a service feature, and we call it Replica. And if the source cloud allows it, which happens most of the time, um, without entering into details right now, data is backed up incrementally to the target while the VM, the source VM is still running. This is very important in order to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, people can, can, can still work on their VMs while all this process is, is, uh, is happening. And the migration is performed on the last step directly on the target cloud. So that means that uh, um, uh, you, you can keep on using your source environment if you want. You can keep on replicating the content of the target. And then if disaster strikes, you can anytime simply start the machines on the target environment because that is the, the way in which, um, in which migration works. And most important, all the info is already on the target, in Kubert in this case. So you don't need to have access to the source. Um, another thing that we insist always a lot, you know, um, migration across two completely different environments like uh, VMware OpenStack or OpenStack on one side and Kubert on the other uh, might hide, of course, some sort of surprises. So the, the main idea is that uh, thanks to the replica mechanism, you can anytime basically out of those replicas create some migrations, test that everything works fine, manually, uh, part of your QA procedures, continuous integration testing, whatever. And, and then only when you need, you can actually finalize those migrations and put them into production. Okay, so those are also very useful. And that helps also a lot when your workload is not made by a single VM, but a lot of different VMs, maybe it could be a database, could be, I don't know, a front end uh, with a web app, uh, some middleware, whatever else. So you want to make sure that all the connectivity among them works fine. And since we talk about Kubert, you might also want to make sure that, for example, some additional um, um, Kubernetes pods, which connect maybe to, the, to services exposed on those VMs, might work as well as you expect. Okay, so um, 
time for our demos. So I will switch to uh, my colleague Gabriel that will continue with the, with the demos. Thank you. Thanks, Alessandro. I think you need to stop sharing your screen for me to be able to share mine. Right away. All right. Let me know when it's coming through. Indeed. Perfect. All right. So uh, I'm going to walk you through to the, through the demo environment first. Then we're going to jump straight into demoing Coriolis. We'll be migrating this CentOS 8 uh, instance from VMware. And I also have a uh, Ubuntu Bionic VM on OpenStack. Both of these will be migrated in a live demo. Hopefully, the demo gods are not angry today. So let's let's uh, get right into it. We'll migrate this to a kubevirt deployment. This is a plain kubevirt deployment uh, on top, uh, deployed with kubeadm. So nothing special here. Kubevirt is enabled. So let's get to the demo. This is Coriolis. Uh, this is the login screen. The first thing you see when you log in to Coriolis is a simple dashboard where you get a sense of um, what's going on inside Coriolis itself. So you get a, uh, a list of recent uh, replicas that were run, migrations, endpoints that you have created, and so on. Now, the first thing you do after you log in into a new uh, Coriolis deployment is you need to add some endpoints. Endpoints are uh, credentials you give to Coriolis to access your source and destination clouds for in order for Coriolis to be able to migrate instances from that source cloud to any destination that we support. These are just a few of the plugins we support, uh, most of them actually, uh, but they will appear in this list as, as you enable them inside Coriolis. Uh, let's add a new kubevirt uh, endpoint. So for kubevirt, you only need to give it a name. So let's say kubevirt demo. And a kubeconfig file, there is nothing special about this kubeconfig file. It's a standard kubeconfig file, which you can see here. You just give it to Coriolis for Coriolis to be able to access your kubevirt deployment. You click validate and save, and Coriolis will go out, uh, connect to uh, Kubernetes, check that the CRD is there. And if it's there, it will uh, give you that green check mark you saw briefly and you, you get an endpoint here you can use to ingest your instances. I also have a couple of OpenStack endpoints and an ESXi 6 endpoint that you see here. So as soon as you have all your endpoints set up, all you have to do is go to replicas. Now, like Alessandro said, replicas are a disaster recovery as a service implementation. You can also have simple migrations, which are a one-off where you do both the, the sync of the data for your instances, as well as the uh, final migration in one operation. Replicas are split in two. You get uh, to sync your disk data uh, re repeatedly and not do the actual migrations if you don't want to. Only commit to doing the migration when disaster strikes and your source cloud is no longer accessible. But if you just want to migrate, you can use simple migrations. Now, to create a new replica, you go to New, Replica. Here you get a toggle if you want to switch between normal migrations and replicas. We're going to go with replicas today. Click on Next. You select your source cloud. We only have OpenStack and VMware uh, defined and the kubevirt one, of course, but that's only as a destination. You choose your ESXi 6 endpoint as a source. Here you get the option to automatically enable CBT snapshots for the instances you are about to migrate. Now you want to do this because CBT will allow us to do incremental uh, replicas, uh, basically diffs from uh, replica run to replica run. And we'll, it also allows us to, if, if thinly provision, uh, only transfer written blocks on the VMDKs that are part of the instance we're about to migrate. So click next. Coriolis reaches out to VMware. It lists the instances. We only have three instances on this. Uh, I mean, we have more, I think, two pages. Yes, six instances in. It seems we're gonna migrate the CentOS 8 instance. But before we do that, let's change something inside of it. So we only have the Anaconda.ks. Let's, let's write a file, say, uh, uh, 
from VMware to kubevirt, write this to a file, I realize the text is small. Uh, this web interface does not really allow you to resize it, but essentially I created a file with a timestamp and some text inside. Now we go back to Coriolis, we click next. Oh, and uh, you can of course migrate multiple instances as a group. So for example, if you have a cluster of servers that you would like to migrate all at once, you can do that. We're just gonna go with one for now. And we want to migrate to KubeVirt. Here we get some target options. Uh, for kubevert, there aren't that many, uh, but we do need to specify the cluster name. We generate a bunch of certificates that we use to communicate uh, with the components we spawn in kubevert to ingest the, the actual disk data. We have a small uh, application that allows us to stream the disk data from your source provider from your source cloud to kubevert inside a, a physical volume that will be setting up automatically. The namespace where you want this to end up, we're just gonna go with the default namespace. You click next here. Now Coriolis traditionally uh, will allow you to specify a mapping between source network and destination network. We only have one network in, in, in this Kubernetes deployment, but of course, if you have Multis enabled and it allows you to create multiple networks, you can choose which network you would like this instance to end up in. So this is a mapping between source network and destination network. For example, if VM network, network on uh, VMware ESXi corresponds to a different network in your Kubernetes deployment, here is the place where you, you can map that. Click next, same thing for storage you get a listing of all the disks that you have enabled for this particular VM. We only have one here, but you can choose with various granularity levels where your uh, storage will end up. So the default storage can be one of the uh, storage classes uh, in your cluster, or you can map a whole data store from ESXi to one of the storage class, uh, classes or individual disks. We're just, gonna, we're just gonna go with the RBD one, click next. Here you have the option to specify any additional customization scripts. These are essentially bash scripts or Python scripts or whatever uh, uh, kind of scripts will work on common Linux uh, instances or PowerShell for Windows. This will allow you to make any last minute changes of your instance while it's being migrated, mi migrated like adding users, uh, changing files and so on. Click next. Here you can add a cron-like schedule. Uh, like, like we said, replicas allow you to do incremental syncs of your instance without committing uh, to migrating it necessarily. Uh, this is a cron-like schedule that will uh, prompt Coriolis to automatically uh, uh, start a new replica for this instance at the desired time. We're not gonna add one here uh, because we don't have time to show it running. You get a summary of uh, everything that's been selected so far, click finish, and when we do that, uh, Coriolis will create a set of tasks that will take care of replicating the disk data, fetching the uh, metadata about the instance from, from your source, uh, and making sure that you get a one-to-one -one copy at the end of this process to your destination. So we're now validating the instance information. Uh, we're checking the CBD status of the instance. If, if it's not enabled, we enable it we validate that the information for the destination is okay, and it is. Now we are deploying uh, the uh, physical volumes. And this is the disk that has just been created. It's a 16 gigabyte disk. We are now creating a bunch of pods that will take care of the disk sync this a particular pod, which has just been spawned, will uh, ingest the disk data from your source. And here we're doing a full CPT snapshot. Uh, the disk in, is a total of 16 gigabytes, but only uh, around 1.8 gigabytes of data are written. So this operation uh, should be quite quick. As this syncs, let's also kick, uh, kick off a sync of the Bi Bionic VM from OpenStack. So let's go to console as well. We'll do the same, write a file to, to this instance. Let's 
Since we have only 30 minutes, uh, we are running basically two demos in parallel. <laughs> so we are <laughs> curious yep. to see how the demo gods work with not one, but two live demos at once. Uh, let's leave, let's leave in the typo. Okay. All right. So let's go to the. I already have a pre-synced replica of that that particular instance. We're just going to execute it. So I did a, a sync of this already, but. This will show how we replicate the deltas. Only a small uh, bit of information will be replicated from source to destination in this particular case. All right. The CentOS one is already done. So while the other one syncs, let's migrate to this one. Now, at this point, you have a one-to-one -one copy of your instance from source to destination. Uh, you have all the disk data in your uh, Kubernetes cluster. All you have to do now is create a migration from it. So we have the metadata at this point. If your source cloud goes down, you're fine. We are going to do OS morphing for this instance because we're moving from a foreign hypervisor, in this case VMware, to a KVM-based OpenStack. So we need to do some changes inside the instance for it to uh, look and feel as if it were always part of kubevert. So let's click on Migrate. Uh, Pop-up should, uh, here we go, View Migration Status. And th these are the set of tasks that will make sure that this instance will properly boot inside kubevert. So what this will do now is create a, a set of snapshots from the disks that were already created. Now, if your backend supports snapshots, it will do them. If not, it's going to be a no op. Um, once the snapshots are created, we create another P, uh, physical volume from those snapshots. Then we'll deploy a, a temporary worker VM to do the changes to your instance for your instance to be able to boot in kubevert. So now it's initializing. If we do a cube CTL get VMI, we see that the worker is running. This is a temporary instance to which we attach the uh, disks of the instance we're migrating. And we'll do a set of operations on those disks that were detailed by, by Alessandro in the slides where we install any needed drivers and make any changes to the actual disk, run your uh, customization scripts that you can optionally set to do last minute, last minute changes, and so on. Once this process is done, your instance will boot up uh, in, a, in a kubevert as if it were always part of kubevert. So here we see we're connected to, connecting to the temporary worker. It's the same IP you see here. We're discovering the, the partitions that we need to look at. And during OS morphing, we also enable serial console, so you can actually uh, connect via serial console to your uh, to your instance. Uh, we're removing any superfluous packet packages we don't no longer need. Open VM tools, for example, is of no use on KVM. We're installing any needed packages. In this case, uh, cloud init regenerating the init RD to make sure that virt IO drivers are included. Let me always also kick off the other migration as well. So, oops. This was the replica we ran. It only had about, if I see, 35 megabytes of changes, I think. OK, so let's kick this one off as well. We're going to skip OS morphing for this one because we're moving from KVM to KVM, so there's nothing to do. Click Migrate. Let's view the status of that as well. It's still generating, ah, oh, here we go, it just finished. This is the CentOS one. So we're dismounting those partitions. 
we're deleting the temporary instance, so it should go away soon. And once this temporary instance is deleted, the final instance will pop up. Or right, here we go. This task is done. It should move on to finalize the replica deployment. And let's see. Both of them are scheduling at the same time. So the OpenStack one, as well as the uh, VMware one. Let's connect to the CentOS one first. Ah, here we go. And it's now booting. The instance we had on VMware is booting on kubevert. It might take a long time for the first boot because it will probably try to relabel. Uh, SE Linux will try to relabel everything. And that will uh, mean another reboot after this. But it should pop up soon enough. In the meantime, let's also connect to the Ubuntu one. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, well, can you please increase the font a bit? Uh, this is not that relevant. So this is the uh, Ubuntu VM that has booted on uh, uh, on Kubert. But let's let's SSH into it after this. So like I said, it's relabeling all the file systems in the CentOS one. It will take a bit longer. Let's connect it uh, using the console here. <clears throat> Alessandro, uh, Gabriel, I'm afraid we are out of time. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry about that. In any case, um, here we go. Ubuntu. And this is the file that there we, we got, got we've written time. previously. So yep. Uh, Thanks for thanks for, yeah, thank you. for your time. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and thanks for the you know running two tables in parallel, quite impressive. Uh, there were a few questions in the chat, but uh, because we ran uh, out of time, I encourage everyone to follow up on Hashbird.